trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestsellers, all they're hyped up to be. The Terrible Book Club explores whether or not you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. If you've ever seen a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Hello and welcome to episode 116 of the Terrible Book Club. I'm Chris, and this is Paris. Hello! And this is our special guest, Dr. Jeremy Swist. Hi, Rete Tiloy. He is an alien, we forgot to tell you. Today's guest is an alien. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, uh, Dr. Jeremy Swist is a classicist, and he's going to help us read today's book which is Kalaroi by Caraton translated by Rosanna Omituwoju. Um, this is the translation that appears in Greek fiction published by Penguin Classics. Kalaroi is considered to be the earliest written romance in Western history, and it establishes a lot of common tropes of the genre that now haunts us mercilessly. So <laughs> after this, I'm going to be able to say that I have a, uh, at least a passing familiarity with um, romance novels of all kind. And I can expressly have an opinion about romances from here on out before yes. it was like, I don't know. I didn't read these that often, but we've read enough. And now I'm reading the Ur romance. So mm-hmm. I can, I can officially have an opinion about them. Yeah. The earliest extant one, which uh, for all intents and purposes, you know, counts i guess yeah <laughs> who knows how many who knows how many preceded it yeah i will yeah, have a question fair. about that shortly <laughs> uh, so since neither of us really know much about ancient greek or roman fiction uh dr jeremy swiss is here today with us as our karen to guide us down the stygian river of bad ancient fiction dr swiss is also known as the metal classicist who studies classical reception in heavy metal music he teaches latin and greek along with roman and greek myths and history uh, most recently, he has taught at Xavier University and the University of Texas at San Antonio and is soon to start a new position at Brandeis University here in Massachusetts. Thanks so very, very much for being here with us today, Dr. Swist. Uh, if you're interested in knowing more about Jeremy's research and interviews, you can find him on Twitter as at Metal Classicist or over at his blog, heavymetalclassicist.home.blog. If this is the first time you've ever listened to the show, what we do here at the Terrible Book Club is we read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover, title, summary, or some combination of the three. Sometimes we read books that our patrons, listeners, or friends recommend. So we do the opposite of what most people do in a bookstore or while they're browsing the internet for an ebook. And usually this experiment results in a disappointing read, but once in a while, we actually end up liking the book. Uh, For content warnings, in addition to our usual barnyard language, uh, today's episode includes discussions of domestic violence, brief mentions of torture and death, and some light sexual topics. And before we get too far, I'm hoping that Dr. Swiss can tell us a little bit about this book being heralded as the first romance novel, like how old it really is, etc. So the best guess is that this came out in the uh, early uh, to mid, maybe uh, first century CE, uh, and it is the first uh, surviving work of uh, what some have sort of called the first novel or romance novel, which is sort of an anachronistic term uh, mm. applied to this, which is really, you know, th- probably the best way to call it is this is extended prose fiction. And such works are written in both Latin and Greek uh, throughout the uh, period of the Roman Empire from the first century BC, sorry, from the first century CE up through, say, the, the sixth century CE. Uh, what's new about this genre that started back, started then is that uh, really uh, these kind of stories 
uh, were not based on, say, mythology or what was perceived to be history, uh, which is usually what the basis of, you know, epic poetry or tragedies uh, or just, you know, history texts like Herodotus and Thucydides were, you know, these were stories that were completely made from whole cloth uh, and featured fictional characters, sometimes loosely based on historical characters or put in an historical setting. So for instance, uh, the Calaroe is set uh, in an historical setting as sort of an historical fiction novel uh, based uh, set in uh, somewhere during the later years of say the Peloponnesian war mm -hmm. at the end, very end of the 400s BCE, uh, some years after the Athenians uh, were uh, defeated by the Sicilian city-state of Syracuse, uh, where the, the novel starts. Uh, and so the Calaroe herself is the daughter of Hermocrates, who was the uh, commander-in-chief of the Syracusans when they repelled the Athenian invasion uh, in uh, 413, thereabouts, uh, BCE. Um, and so this is, a, this is a time when... Uh, you know, much of the Eastern Mediterranean and beyond was ruled by the Persian Empire. This was before Alexander came along and conquered it. However, uh, Caraton himself was writing during the Roman Empire when all of the stuff they're talking about, for the most part, was ruled uh, by Rome. Uh, and this is pretty typical for Greek fiction of the time. The Greeks were that were living under the Roman Empire often wrote about uh, their past when they were free uh, and when, you know, they achieved, you know, things that, you know, they wanted to be remembered for. Uh, and so uh, while Caraton was based in the Roman Empire, he wrote about stuff that happened back when, you know, during the so-called classical age of Greece. Um, and so what's kind of new with this kind of extended prose fiction that's new is that, well, it's for one thing, it's in prose. Mm -hmm. And usually storytelling and fiction uh, and romance, that was usually the domain of poetry. Uh, you think of love poetry, uh, you know, uh, and stories, erotic stories from uh, tragedy, as well as even in works like the Odyssey. So putting it into prose uh, is something new. And again, as I said, um, it is kind of using sort of, you might call stock characters uh, right. who uh, are not based in mythology or anything. Uh, so something you'd more see in say, uh, you know, uh, ancient comedy. Uh, and those stock characters usually have, um, you know, stock traits, you know, the star-crossed lovers, you mm -hmm. know, the, uh, the braggart soldier and all of that. And so a lot of those characters show up in here and kind of recycle a lot of familiar tropes. So this genre didn't come out of nowhere, but it's sort of the synthesis of a lot of different kind of cultural trends and literary tropes uh, in order to produce uh, something new for a more general audience than than usual is kind of the the assumption here, uh, which is which is uh, quite interesting. Yeah, thanks. Can you tell That's... that Jeremy is a professor. Yeah, I was going to say <laughs> this you is great. Tell that? We have a which real expert on off, today. Which means I go on rants, uh, and I don't know when to stop talking. So please shut me up whenever. No, I just <laughs> no, that was perfect. Get all um, that no. data out up front there. Hey, man, <laughs> we needed that. All that historical context is really important. And actually, what you just uh, what you were just ending on there, the idea that some of these concepts were actually present in comedies like play plays and stuff before this novel. So this novel mm -hmm. maybe didn't wasn't the first one to come up with like star cross lovers, but it maybe is the it's the first one in this format. And also because it was made for a bigger audience is likely or perhaps the reason or one of the reasons why so many of these uh, tropes survive, which we'll get into a little bit later. I have a question about there being an audience here. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that a lot of stuff was in sort of poetry format, epic poetry, perhaps plays and the like. And um, when we get novels here, so this wasn't a paperback that you got down at the Greek bookstore, <laughs> as far as I know. Yeah, yeah. Books was were there not... a scroll store with like a I... lot of? <laughs> I hope like, so. Like you had to lug the whole scroll home and like unfurl it. Yeah, dude, it. that's how you read things in the ancient world. <laughs> well, I just want—I don't know, man. I, I want to be or sure on, here. Or on tablets, I guess. But wait, <laughs> oh wait. Well, we do tablets now, so I mean, <laughs> that's true. A little has, what changed. has changed. So wait, I had to go to the scroll store and lug the whole scroll home. How big are we talking? They're not here? that like, heavy. The... I mean, unless it's really long. I don't know. Jeremy knows hey, this more was about pretty this long, than I man. Do. Like, I don't know. Okay, so well, you'll notice that um, you know, 
it was divided into eight books, uh, mm-hmm. and that's kind of corresponds to chapters. So the Iliad and the Odyssey each were divided into 24 books is what we call them. Uh, but what that really means, it corresponds to a papyrus scroll. So there's eight papyrus scrolls that make up this the, this whole story. Uh, and in fact, yes, there was uh, a book trade in the ancient world. Okay, you could go uh, and buy uh, papyrus scroll copies of uh, you know the Iliad, the Odyssey, and of course these Greek romance novels and several other texts um, if you had if you could afford it. Uh, and of course, if you were privileged enough to have the education that you could read. It. Okay, so, you know, this was before the printing press, and so uh, quite a lot of resources and time were put into producing copies of these texts, and so they were quite expensive, but not maybe as expensive as, as you might think. I was just about to ask, like, could you ballpark in, like, current dollars <laughs> how much one scroll, like one episode of Calaroe Oh, no, I only have enough me. for two scrolls of Calaroe. What am I going to do? <laughs> Shit. You got to get a pirate copy by yeah. someone just telling it to you. <laughs> I mean, a lot of I mean, a lot of novels, you know, that like Charles Dickens books, didn't they just appear serially yeah, in penny, like, newspapers penny and stuff? Yeah, exactly. Or, yeah. And so this, this this could have been a similar kind of thing. Um, but I, I, I can't really give you a figure there. Um, but, okay. uh, you Fair know, enough. you had to, you know, during, especially during the Roman Empire, when the high, the high Roman Empire, when these were, you know, at their height, uh, you know, this was a time when, you know, Still, the majority of people were not literate, but a larger number of people were literate than there were before and for some time after. Uh, And so there was, you know, a there was an available readership. And the question that, you know, scholars ask is, you know, what was the nature of this readership? And, you know, it sort of ranges. And also the fact that, you know, you know, there's a uh, there's several novels that survive and there with varying degrees of sophistication mm. eh? and uh the calaroe is one of the uh, uh admittedly least sophisticated of uh <laughs> these novels like if you go ahead and read uh the ethiopian tale by heliodorus it's a lot more complex like it starts it has flashbacks it starts in the oh, middle of the damn. action and there's oh, a lot of there's oh, a lot of crazy, revealing a lot of the content stuff here. going on <laughs> whereas this whereas you know the calaroe you know it starts you know at the beginning and just goes you know uh you know, diachronically all the way through. Mm. Uh, and so, was, and also it's in written in a pretty, uh, you know, uh, uncomplicated Greek style. Like I was able to sit down and read this whole thing in the Greek uh, over the course of a few days, of, of a few days. I couldn't do that with, you know, a speech of Demosthenes or, Thuc- or Thucydides history or anything like that. I'd probably yeah. throw the book across the room yep. after two hours. So this, so that gives you an idea of that this was more accessible to a wider readership that was perhaps not as highly educated as, you know, the elites of the Roman Empire, you know, in Greece and elsewhere were to be able to consume, you know, the high and study the high literature, uh, you know, the, the classics of, you know, Homer and Plato uh, and on the, et cetera. Um, and as, and because of that, uh, even during their time, it seems that these novels, if we can call them those, were not well respected among the the literary elite. Oh, good. Nothing uh, has changed during the period. Exactly. <laughs> <That's> they, <all. laughs> there's there's very little mention of them, so it's sort of the condemnation of silence. But there are a few uh, exceptions of you know uh, people you know saying uh, kind of dismissing these texts as you know on they're not you know they're not uh, worthy of being read. Uh, Little did they and it's, know. And it's, the usual, and it's the usual thing where, you know, if something is accessible to a wider audience, therefore it must, of course, mean that right. uh, they are, of, they are of, of, of less value. And that same sort of stigma is, you know, is a, there's the same stigma against, you know, romance novels today. Yeah. Right, you know, it's it's trash novels, and so I mean, Paris uh, and I novels, aren't exactly not. You know, we, yeah. we're sort of turning our noses up at those a lot of the time too. So. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, yeah, but for, yeah. for 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 reasons that are a lot different. Um, really, do you think so, Paris? <laughs> I think there was probably a bunch of people back then that were like, "Why this is garbage? It's too horny all the time. You're just uh, wasting no. your time." Well, I think I think that we tend to hate romance novels when they're not nuanced and they just kind of. Yeah, they're not nuanced. They have no so depth. So exactly what Jeremy of... just said. Yeah, that's fair. This one is yeah. Complex, okay, fine. So. All right, I'm I'm a I'm a Greek asshole. That's I'm determined. <laughs> I, that's who I am. 
Oh, um, yeah. Th- thanks, Jeremy. That's all. That all helps uh, this make a lot more sense because. I remember Chris and I were talking, we were, we were writing notes about the writing style and I was like, yeah, it's a little plotting. It's a little more like telling instead of showing, but that makes total sense, right? Like mm-hmm. I, I get why if you're trying to make sure that it's accessible to a ri- wide range of people and, you know, um, most folks are kind of on the lower end of literate, then it makes a lot of sense. <sighs> yeah. And, uh, but again, um, you know, a lot of the other novels like Heliodorus and Achilles Tatius, and these are the author's names, uh, you know, they were, they survive in several manuscripts and they seem to have been very popular in the Byzantine Middle Ages when they were copied down and survived that way. And then into the early modern period when after the Renaissance, you know, Western Europeans were reading a lot of these novels. But it seems that uh, the Calaroi uh, just barely survived in like a single manuscript from okay. from Byzantium. And it was just kind of just ignored even through the, you know, the modern period until, uh, you know, it, uh, you know, it appeared in, in, a, in an edition, you know, sort of in, the, I think, the, the, the 1700s. Uh, yeah. and, uh, so, and I think it's just because, you know, this is, uh, you know, the beginning of this, we could call this the beginning of the genre. You have to start somewhere. And probably the only reason that it survives is, is perhaps there was the judgment, oh, this was the original. And so, you know, yeah. you know, that's, uh, you know, it's worthy of, of survival, uh, then. TBC even digs through ancient trash for you listeners. That's how far we're willing to go. Well, speaking of ancient trash, <laughs> it's actually ancient trash is the reason that we know a lot more about this and that we know that this was actually more popular than, you know, kind of the literary uh, history has has us believe. Because uh, in the 19th century uh, is when a lot of like German scholars and this was the beginning of the discipline classics, you know, a lot of them wrote really dismissively about these novels as like, you know, they were emblematic of this period of decadence. Uh, you know, mm. in Greek literature under the Roman Empire, you know, and it's, you know, they, they, they paled in comparison to the high literature of, you know, uh, classical Athens and whatnot. Okay. Uh, but then at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, they found a scrap heap of a bunch of papyrus scraps in Egypt, in the sands of Egypt that were preserved from antiquity, okay, a literal trash dump, okay. Mm. Uh, and they found several fragments of this text a uh, preserved. And the conclusion that was drawn is that this may, at least in places like Egypt, ha- seems to have had a much wider readership uh, than we thought. And just like today, this wider readership, you know, did not necessarily own these books. Uh, you know, again, it took uh, it was quite an expense to copy these, uh, and only the elites, you know, were able to. Uh, assemble their own private libraries. However, uh, it wasn't just Alexandria that had a library or a public library, if we can call it that. Um, Every major city and even maybe minor city in throughout the empire uh, had what you might call a public library. So for instance, in the city of Rome, uh, we had Greek and Latin libraries uh, in various locations, in various bathhouses, uh, so bath complexes such as the Baths of Caracalla, you know, they had pools and gyms and it was athletic, but there was also actually libraries where you could uh, read some of this material theoretically, as well as uh, various imperial fora like Trajan's Forum, where you have the column and the marketplace. There was also uh, imperial libraries. Uh, and this was the case in places like Antioch and Ephesus, uh, etc., uh, as well as in uh, places like Pompeii, where we have uh, papyrus scrolls from libraries uh somewhat preserved, uh, and we are using various technology to read them. So uh, it's not certain, you know, whether this type of literature would have been stocked in these libraries. But again, these papyrus finds do suggest uh, that it was uh, more people reading this stuff uh, than uh, than we might have previously thought before. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's like I said, that's a whole great context and a lot more than I think we could have managed on our own. So thank oh, for you sure. for, for giving us that wonderful um, expertise. Uh, yeah, I don't know, Chris, I know, did you, I, well, I guess maybe he answered all of the questions yes. that you had yes, about, okay, 
All right, great. So that's, yeah, that's a great place to start now that we're all kind of on the same scroll here. You know, we can keep going. Uh, so um, I had to spend 1,000 Greek dollars on it. <laughs> it was my entire paycheck for three years. Oh. And I only got one book. <laughs> when Jeremy was talking about, like, the fact that you would need, you know, if, like, this is eight chapter, eight books, eight chapters, you need eight scrolls. I was thinking about, like, you know, those, those like, all those ladies that have their little like strap to carry their uh, their yoga mat. I'm just imagining someone being like, uh, like just strapping eight fucking scrolls to their back and being like, oh god, I had oh this better be enough entertainment for six months or whatever. Oh. Well, yeah, you uh, you would stick all those scrolls into this kind of leather cylinder thing called a scrinium. Oh, um, and they would they were actually pretty easy to transport in those. Uh, you know, there's some. There's some evidence of what they looked like from like frescoes and stuff. So oh, sick scrinium, <laughs> yeah. the ancient backpack, fabulous. Yep. <laughs> I'm gonna start calling my bag. Oh, it's my scrinium. It's where I keep my. Don't do that. No, don't do that. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, all right, so let's actually get into uh, yeah, Calaroe. Yeah, I was calling Calaroe Caliro. <laughs> I, I was saying know. clear ho yeah oh jesus yeah uh this is gonna be an episode where chris and i butcher the greek language and jeremy tries to revive it uh each step of the way oh uh, i think this is also a bring first... it on yeah oh you can... i know you i know you got us that's a cool i think this is a first where we have a guest who read the same book as we did but in a different language entirely so that's fun uh jeremy read this in greek and ancient Greek, and we read it in the translated English because it has been a long time since I was a classic student and I never took Greek. I only took Latin because I was lazy. So, uh, so yeah, fun. Uh, all right. Our little, well, the back of the scroll summary here for Calaroe <laughs> is uh, just a sentence. So this won't take very long. Uh, all right. Ahem. In this collection of Greek fiction written between the 1st and 4th centuries AD, Calaroe is the stirring tale of star-crossed lovers. Curious? <laughs> Jeremy looking at you. Is that, that's cherry ass. Cur it's cherry Curious, ass. Curious works or Kyrius, uh, you know. All right. Um... Kyrius and Calaroe <laughs> torn apart when she is kidnapped and sold as a slave. Da -da. That's kind of it. Um, I can go over our characters and setting and uh, yeah, you do this. Actually, you get, you I was get to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck me. Actually, I was going to say, uh, Jeremy kind of already gave us the setting. So we'll just go over some essential characters and then Chris will read the, uh, the terrible book club summary of all of the plot points. So if you are someone who is, I don't know, very scared of spoilers for fiction that's been around for thousands of years, perhaps skip ahead <laughs> uh, or don't listen to this. So, all right. All I was right, waiting got... for the next scroll. What the fuck? <laughs> Can't believe you. Um, all right. So our main girl. Ka oh, fuck. I'm going to say it wrong. Calaroe. Total Greek babe. And then we've got Koreas. A total Greek man, babe. So two babely people. Uh, Theron, grave robber in general. Fuck up. Uh, I. It's not Dionysius, right, Jeremy? It's like something. That's fine. Weird. Is that Dionysius? Dionysius. 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 Whatever. Okay. Dionysius. Or just, or just, or just Dennis. Dennis. That's where we get the word Dennis from. <laughs> Holy no, he's serious. Like Dionysius is where we get the word, the fucking name. All right, Dennis, the noble who purchases. Calorie. I mean, it's 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 Denis in French, you know, D E N Y S. So I think that's where we get Dennis. But uh. and well, in in Portuguese, it's Denis. So yeah, you're probably right. Um, Her book club, Dennis etymology. <laughs> <laughs> just in case you were just itching to know what where Dennis came from. Uh, anyway, Dennis is the noble who purchases Calroy from Theron by way of his servant, Plangon. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. All right. I, I just keep, you can't see me right now, listeners, but I just keep like, like looking up at Jeremy on the screen. Uh, Plangon is a, the lady servant for Dionysius who helps Calaroe out of jams. Um, Mithridates. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, or, Mith or, Mithri or Mithridates. Mithridates, <laughs> Mithridates. Dotties, dotties. Eh, you know, they're all, it's all Greek to me. A higher up noble who is also hot for Calaroe because Calaroe? No, is that right? Did I say that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. again? Yeah, okay, okay. And then, okay, this is fun. We have Artaxerxes, the Persian king, who is 
also hot for Calaroe. And then we have Artaxerxes the eunuch, <laughs> the servant of Artaxerxes. Definitely not fucking confusing and infuriating. I thought that there was like a recurring typo and they were the same person for a couple pages. <laughs> and then I was like, wait, these are two totally different people. Uh, Statira, the queen of Persia, who also helps Calaroe. And then Polycarmus or Poly Polycarmus, uh, Korea. Polycharmus, buddy, please. Po- yeah, Polycharmus, the most fucking <laughs> milady name of all time. Uh, but po- it's really Polycarmus. All right, so those those are our main our main folks. Uh, Chris, I I would love for you to read this glorious summary for us. Take, take okay, it I'm going to do a little bit of a character here since it's sort of the way you wrote this. Yes. Um, I am not going to bother to make sure I get any of these names right. So, you know, just <laughs> okay. hold on to your butts here, everyone. Okay, you ready? I'm ready. I got my, I'm holding on to my toga. I'm good. My body is ready. <laughs> okay. Calaroe is this super hot lady, right? Carius is this super hot dude. They live in the city of Syracuse in Sicily, late in the 400s BCE. Eros ensures that they literally walk into each other on the street and it's love at first sight. Their families hate each other. The townsfolk think this match is so good that they pressure the families into allowing these two to marry. Once they marry, all of Calaroe's previous suitors are pissed and conspire to break up their marriage with a cheating ruse. Carius is dumb and believes the ruse, kicking Calaroe so hard that everyone thinks she's dead. They have a fabulously extravagant funeral that catches the eye of Theron, a career pirate who decides to rob Calaroe's tomb of its riches after the funeral. Meanwhile, Calaroe, who is of course still alive, awakens in her tomb. Theron rescues her during the robbery, but decides to sell her as a slave to Dionysius, a rich recent widower in the city of Miletus in Ionia, the west coast of modern-day Turkey. Everyone, Dionysius included, thinks she must be Aphrodite in the flesh because she's just too hot. Despite being sold as a slave, she is treated like the noble she actually is, and Dionysius falls in love with her. Calorori realizes she's pregnant with Carius' child, but the slave woman Plangon advises her to marry Dionysius and pretend it's his child since she's only two months pregnant. Calorori wants to have an abortion, but a dream vision of Carius convinces her not to. Back in Syracuse, Carius and friends find the tomb ransacked and Calaroe missing. Carius goes on an epic quest to find her and does eventually come upon Theron's ship. Theron is found guilty and impaled at Calaroe's tomb while Carius continues on his search in Ionia. However, he also ends up enslaved and sold off in Caria and discovers Calaroe has remarried. She thinks he's dead and holds a grand funeral for him where yet another rich guy, the Persian governor of the province, Mithradates, falls in love with her at first sight. Mithradates is actually Carius' owner and helps reunite him with Calaroe, but only so that he can swoop in and steal her for himself. His plot is prematurely revealed and he goes to his friend Pharnaces, governor of Lydia and Ionia, for help. But you guessed it, Pharnaces is also in love with Calaroe, so he in turn asks the Persian king, Artaxerxes, for help. The king holds a trial to determine if Dionysius or Carius is Calaroe's true husband, but guess what? He is also in love with Calaroe, so he postpones the trial. Meanwhile, Carius keeps trying to kill himself. There's a sudden revolt in Egypt that Artaxerxes must tend to, so he takes Calaroe along. Carius enlists in the Egyptian army, becomes an admiral, and wins a naval battle, and ends up finding Calaroe in the course of the war. They sail back to Syracuse and live happily ever after. <laughs> Yay! Oh, yeah, so there's just a lot of stuff happening in this in this uh, novel, even though it's pretty short. It's only 100 and, I don't know, 127, 147... Pages? Eight papyrus scrolls. It's eight yes. papyrus. All right, we got eight scrolls, so not like the 24, you know, not like the full epic here. It's only eight, so sizable. Uh, I would say, I don't know, there was there were plenty of things that were, I don't know, good things about it. There were some good things. Uh, I I was reading this, and I was like, oh, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of weird that it starts off, like the first line is like, it is me, Caraton. I have written this thing. I am from here. I was like, oh, yeah. Caratop, guess... back in time to yeah, write I... the first romance novel. <laughs> the first romance jazzercise. Um, and first I... romance prop humor-based novel. 
I just thought it was funny. I was like, yeah, announcing yourself at the beginning of a novel is funny in a modern context, but I get that in ancient times, you know, you're not going to waste papyri on like entire pages with dedications and like author names and stuff. So it it made more sense to me after I like stopped for a second and thought about it. (laughs) And that in papyrus scrolls, you know, don't have book covers where you have, you know, so, so, you know, usually, you know, there's a tag on the papyrus scroll that has like the title or like the first like line of it to kind of tell you what the book is. Uh, and so it was pretty standard then for the author to identify themselves, you know, at the beginning and or end of the work like that. So that's nothing out of the ordinary for, for ancient literature here. You know, Thucydides, the Athenian, Herodotus, of Peloponnesus, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah blah, blah, blah. Par- Paris of Somerville, you know, uh, Chris of Dorchester. <laughs> uh. Uh, I thought I actually felt like the pacing was pretty good. There's always something happening and I'm pretty interested in where each like plot point will lead, you know, while I was reading it anyway. Um, There was there was a section maybe like three quarters of the way in where it got a little sleepier. But for the most part, kind of, you know, things things were happening. Things, were, you know, it's got, I mean, you only got so ships, much got... scroll space, right? Like you have to <laughs> keep it brief. Keep it going. Yeah, I, I mean, I appreciate Maybe that's that. what we should do with some of the authors for these self-published. That's the real problem here, Paris. Like, self-publishing and digital publishing means people can ramble on for so long. If we limited them, maybe they'd get to the point a little bit quicker. Yeah, you know what? You're right. Maybe if we told them they could only have sc- one scroll. They had one scroll. <laughs> Four scrolls. But then we maybe. wouldn't have 800-page meandering fantasy novels, which is kind of my <laughs> shit, too. So, you yeah. know. <laughs> Um, let's see. Oh, I just wrote that, like, I guess we already talked about this. The writing wasn't amazing. There are some good turns of phrase, but it was clear. You know, I was never confused about what was going on, which sounds like a low bar to clear. But let me tell you, it does not always clear it on the show. (laughs) So It's very unsubtle, though, right? It's unsubtle in a lot of ways. Like, every emotion is always displayed by an entire crowd of people all the time and the entire crowd is having the same emotion. Everyone is crying (laughs) or cheering and clapping. It it really reads like those internet stories where it ends like, and then everyone stood up and clapped because that man was Albert Einstein and he loved Jesus. (laughs) It really really reads like one of those, let me tell you. I mean, I guess guess you're right um, about that, but... Every time Calaroe shows up in public, everyone falls flat on their faces. It's seriously like, it it just got to like (laughs) Looney Tunes levels of absurdity i mean that's actually People one of my crying one of my... and like falling at her feet and like and everyone like, oh, is though it's like an entire crowd everyone. of people domino yeah. style apparently just <laughs> completely buffeted by how hot she is she is a force of hot nature yeah uh it was it was just looney tune shit yeah which is actually something that i i put in my things that were not good section because i just found it ludicrous so we'll we'll hold on that for now Um, I, so I actually thought that there were some good turns of phrase in the translation and that the text was pretty approachable for modern readers. I thought the translation was good. However, Chris, uh, felt like, I don't know, man, it's like, it was weird. There'll be a line here or two where it just talks, it literally has the phrase like, and then Carius and Polycharmus were hanging around for a bit. And I don't know, that just kind of ruins the ancient Greek vibe for me when you call it hanging around. I understand that, as Jeremy said, this was sort of an accessible text to begin with here. But I don't know, man, I, It for me, as a modern reader who is undoubtedly, you know, thousands of years removed from it, I just, I it kind of ruins the spell, I suppose. But it's not like Carrot Top could have known that thousands of years ago <laughs> and wrote that specifically. I suppose the translator could have worked some of that in for me. And I don't know what would have been better to put in there. What what, what was the, like the original phrasing there? Perhaps Jeremy, it's a very specific yeah. line, so I don't think you'll be able to recall I, this off the top of your head. Yeah. I mean, you know, this wasn't li- written in a high literary reg- register. This was written in the Koine dialect of ancient Greek that everyday people spoke. Okay? Uh, and so, you know, they they had words and kind of phrases for things and figures of 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 speech and whatnot that, you know, we use in everyday speech today. So the word, so the term for hanging around, uh, you know, that strikes me as a common translation of uh, the verb uh, diatribo, uh, which means sort of just to, it it really just kind of means that to sort of, uh, um, 
you know, spend time in one place or just it, post it, it literally, it literally means to like tread something out or something like you're, you're kind of, you know, you're kind of pacing back and forth or something like that is sort of the, what's going on here. Uh, but it's also where we get the word diatribe from. Mm. Uh, so it has a, it, it's a, it's a, it's got a range of, of meanings. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I actually liked some of the turns of like, there's this description of, uh, Carius at the beginning. Um, it says that he was, quote, gleaming like a star. The rosy glow from exercise was added to the natural bloom of his radiant face, just like gold inlaid on silver. And I was like, God damn, that's actually a pretty OK way to describe someone's beauty without, I don't know, without kind of falling into his creamy of... skin. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I, it, uh, I just thought that there were some turns of phrase like that that were good. And, and I was unsure um, if they were kind of if those things were sort of part of the Greek parlance and were literal translations, or if this was um, like a stylistic choice of um, uh, or Dr. Amit Woju who translated it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that specific description of, of, of Carius at the beginning, you know, makes perfect sense that he would, you know, be described as shiny, you know, like gold there, because, you know, for one thing, you know, men and aristocratic men, you know, uh, they would have had, you know, very kind of bronze bodies from, hanging out outside and exercising and having the uh you know having the ability to go to the gymnasium all the time right uh and that's the mark an aristocrat is they don't have to spend all day working so they can go to you know the the gym and that which was kind of one of their main social spaces of privileged aristocratic men would go uh and so you know this is a time when uh, you know, they, the male body was seen as sort of the, the most kind of perfect work of art by the gods or whatever. Uh, and so, you know, glistening with the sweat of exercise, mm. uh, you know, would have, you know, would, would have marked him as, you know, a, as an ideal specimen of, of, of male beauty. So what you're telling me is that Carius could do some gym tan and laundry in his spare time and therefore be hot as hell. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Mm hmm. Jersey yeah, Shore no, references like, for you TBC listeners uh, out there that I'm sure have a lot of crossover there. Syracusean Shores, uh, <laughs> right? Um, We're just hanging out at the gym, pumping iron, getting tan, doing some diatribes I'll out be here. All being naked together because it's Greece and that's what we do. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Some other good stuff about this. Um, me, uh, Chris, this, Chris, this is your note, but men are kind of freely crying and moved to tears, and it's just fine and normal, which is great. We fucking never see that shit in yeah. modern Dudes romance. Can or be fiction. emotive here and like be moved to tears over a range of things, not just sad stuff, but like being happy, and it's it's totally yeah. fine and normal for them to express emotion outwardly, and perhaps even rashly. I mean, that's sort of like a classic male trope that still, you know lingers to this day including i mean <laughs> my favorite rash male emotion moment that i'm sure tons of people um picked out when they read this was um when there's that plot that all of Calaroe's suitors try to sort of get up on her when she marries Carius, they're like, well, let's pretend that she's cheating on him so that Carius mm -hmm. divorces her. I don't know what the plan was here <laughs> to really what the end was or something. But anyway, Carius does. It does seem like maybe Calaroe is running a two time in game on him. So the next time he sees her, he uh, runs up to her and just kicks her square in the stomach. Like a child might when he's mad at you. Yeah, I also ended up laughing at that, even though I know it's like technically domestic violence and sad, but you're right. The way that it's depicted in the text is it's extremely yeah, it sounds, childish. It, it's like man getting hit by a football, you know? It's <laughs> it, like, sounds oh. like it, it really reads like a little boy just going. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then, and then I was like, wait, how does it kick to her? To her, like, abdomen, render her in a death-like, like, silence, death-like, uh, I don't know, coma. I was just, I was just so confused. I was like, I don't understand. It was an extremely good kick. Yeah, <laughs> real good. So, um, and I'm not sure if this is intentional because this was written probably around the same time, but, uh, according to the sources... Uh, the Emperor Nero uh, did the exact same thing to his wife, Popea. Uh, oh. he, got, he got mad at her one day and he kicked her square in the stomach 
when while she was pregnant too, oh, and Jesus. she just died. So, so this, uh, if we believe the historical sources, uh, this is this is something that actually appeared to have happened. All right, so Greek uh, women got to get to the gym, ladies. Strong cores, yeah. strong cores. Don't be murdered by a kick to the abdomen. <laughs> just, just get those crunches in. You know, get some dancing in. Strong horse, strong horse. And then when the emperor kicks you in the stomach, you can just stand there and take it and he will be yes. dumbfounded. And then you mm -hmm. will be empress of Rome. That's how that works. <laughs> Correct. You're stronger. Sadly, only it would appear that only Spartan women were really allowed to go to the gym. <laughs> I guess that makes sense then. I guess, yeah, if you're not, if you're not like keeping up with your physical stuff. Yeah, I guess this kick to the stomach could be, could be critical, a critical injury. <laughs> I don't think we should test this though, Paris. So don't, <laughs> listeners at home, don't run up and kick someone in the stomach and see if you can put them in a temporary coma so that you can then rob their grave and steal their treasures. <laughs> no. Uh, anyway, we were supposed to be talking about things we liked about it. And then you talked about that scene, which I don't, I don't know if we, if we liked that scene. I found it funny and hilarious. Funny. And therefore yeah. <laughs> I kind of liked it. <laughs> Um, do you want Chris, do you want to, uh, attend to the rest of your, your notes about what we liked? Sure. Um, this was just a mild bit of amusement for me, but, um, the, the ruler of, um, what was he? Pharmacies? Walgreens? Farna Farnassies? Was it? Rite Aid. It was, uh, Rite Aid was the ruler <laughs> yes. Yes. of both Ionia and Lydia. And uh, if you're if you aren't musically inclined, um, we still name modes of the major scale after Greek islands. Um, there is Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian, which I don't think is a real Greek isle, but perhaps a variation on that. <laughs> no, it's the, it's the cool side of the isle. It's Mixolydian. And cool Locrian. Side. So the fact that uh, Walgreens here ruled both of the major modes <laughs> of Ionia and Lydia, and, Lydia. and I'm yeah. assuming Mixolydian. I, I, was there a Mixolydia out there? I don't think so. But. Uh, probably well, not. So, so Ionia, Lydia, and Phrygia um, were... Uh, regions of Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, uh, and uh, in the, no, the wait, western part. That doesn't part. make any sense. No, but no, no, it has to be Asia Major, except for Phrygia, which has a flat second <laughs> and a flat third. <laughs> so. Yeah, but uh, but during uh, you know during the historical setting of the book, these were provinces of the Persian Empire, and so Pharnaces mm. was a satrap or you know a governor of that province. Uh, so answerable only to the king of kings, Artaxerxes, who ruled from 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 Persia, you know, modern day Iran. So it just <laughs> so that's that's what makes sense there. Uh, I can't really speak to the the provenance of the uh, of the musical mode stuff. That's not really my forte. <laughs> Wait, so Chris, are there also islands called this, and then these? So this is just a I thought it was islands, but I guess it's states. Oh, uh, for yeah, some reason, I had in my head that they were islands of some kind. Oh, okay. But it's Mediterranean, right? So like, kind yeah. of. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're regions uh, yeah. mainly. Like the Dorian kind of refers to like one of the major ethnic groups of the Greeks they're on really the mainland. Smooth out there, like, cat. They're they're really jazzy out there. They've got that major six, yeah. and it just yeah. so like the, Spart everything. the Spartans were Dorians, for example. For what it's worth, I don't know. So the Spartans <laughs> like jazz. Okay, I get that. <laughs> yes, yes, Spartans like jazz. Can I ask you, were the Locrians super weird and hard to deal with? Uh, I mean, they weren't really major players. Uh, as yeah, they're definitely the not. Fuck uh, them. <laughs> poli po politically, but, uh, you know, they... Yeah, no one likes Locrian. No one no, likes who? Locrian. No I one uses even... that shit. Bjork uses that shit, and that's... Oh, it. God, that makes so much sense. I, I was going to say, I can't think of a single artist who uses Locrian, but Bjork... Oh, fucking Bjork. Bjork. It's got a flat fifth. Here. It's terrible. It's Ugh. not even a full diminished scale. That's the only yeah. time you really want to use a flat fifth. So Yeah, it's, it's gross. It's gross. Anyway, that's my uh, music bit there. <laughs> yeah. well, net, net, net. well, I don't know. You had some other fun notes about names. Yes. For example, uh, the queen of Persia being named Statira or Statira <laughs> is yeah. like, that's got to be some made up shit there, man. Yeah. That's like naming your king Governoron or yeah. Rulero or something. <laughs> that's true. Uh, the, you know, Arta King Artaxerxes, uh, I think Artaxerxes, the, the second or third who, uh, you know, who ruled around this time, his wife was named Statira. Wow. Okay, so that's that's historical there. And uh, I, it might be related to the fact that uh, Persian gold coins were called staters. Mm. So so her um, name was literally not, cash I'm... money. OK, I guess. <laughs> 
this is it, Persian Kesha. That's what's happening. Right now. I'm not saying that ex cathedra, but uh, that's <laughs> that's kind of where my mind went. This is my wife, Money. Perhaps you've known her. Perhaps you met her. Perhaps. Yeah, and of course these are all. Of course, these are all the Hellenizations of all of these Persian names True. that would have been, you True. know, like you know. So Artaxerxes would have been like Ardashah or something like that. Oh uh, yeah, Ar Ardashir, I think, uh, would be the the Persian version. Like that um, phrase. Speak, there was also another <laughs> yeah, name in here. This was a very throwaway character, but it amused me to no end when I saw him. <laughs> he was like the the father of like one of Stadira's like ladies that were help in her court or something like that. Uh, I, yeah, anyway, I his name is Mega Bezos. <laughs> you thought Jeff with his yacht pulling a yacht was bad. You haven't met fucking Mega Bezos. He only pays you $5 an hour <laughs> for 60 <laughs> hours of overtime work in his warehouse where he ships everything to all of Europe, not just Greece. He doesn't just own fucking commerce he owns the roads <laughs> he owns everything to possibly do with getting goods anywhere the mega bezos yeah he, he has like so he has a yacht pulling a yacht but then the yacht pulling the yacht is also being pulled by fighter jets and then those are being pulled don't ask how an ancient greek guy got fighter jets but he has them he's rich enough that sounds like one of Caligula, Caligula's, uh, you know, triremes or something. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but uh, Megabizus was a pretty common uh, Persian name mm. in in Greek literature. So uh, so yeah, this is <laughs> per this perhaps isn't made up. <laughs> he is like an amalgamation of a bunch of other smaller Greek merchants that fuse together to form the Mega. The me yes, yes. This is what happened when like. <laughs> Some bazaar somewhere got, I don't know, like hit with a, a crazy wind and they all just slammed into mega bitch. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> and they and they have to fight off the uh, specter of, I don't know, was there communism in ancient Greece? Yeah. Like they had to fight off the specter of, I don't know, <laughs> Bernie Sandoz or something. <laughs> Burneros. Burn Burneros Sandoz. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm just going to leave that alone. <laughs> okay. And my final thing that I really enjoyed was just this one line. And I mean, there was a couple of times something like this popped up, but um, it was just a line here. Um, it was evening and much of the booty still remained <laughs> for a party scene. <laughs> yeah, that sounds that like a bunch of dudes at a great party. in a party scene, too. Oh, was it? Oh, yeah. yeah. In a party scene, too. Right. So, like, you know, not totally off there, but, you know, it's just... I'm. I had to giggle. Yeah, yeah. It's a, I'm a it's child. Fun. I know it. So I'm just going to plug my friends, uh, um, uh, Avon and Mark. They do the uh, Endless Knot podcast, and they actually – I listened to an episode recently. They do a lot of etymology stuff, and apparently mm -hmm. the word booty, meaning you know the plunder or spoils of war or whatever, uh, is unrelated to the word booty, you know, meaning you know a someone's uh, behind. derriere. Yeah. Behind. So apparently booty is related to like – uh, boot or like a word that means like good or goods, mm. or something like that. You know, what boots it, right? You know, what's the benefit or something right. like that. So, uh, so yeah, yeah. Listen to the Endless Knot podcast. Uh, they're, they're, they're good people. I should check that out because I love um, word etymology. That's really interesting because I, I always thought that, the, that it, you know, that one came from the other, but huh, brilliant. I mean, also, just so you know, uh, Professor, you're not in class here. You can say ass. <laughs> That's ass, 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 ass. There you go. Get it all out. Get it all out. <laughs> Wait, actually, like that's that's Thank what's you. playing at the Thank Greek you. party. It's just like someone's just being like ass, ass. ass. <laughs> just imagine. I mean, have you seen erotic Greek vase paintings? Oh, it's like, ass, ass, ass everywhere. Yeah, that's it's true. It's uh, it's you know, Rule Thirty Four. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the internet. <laughs> it's just if you can think about it, it's on a vase. Yeah. Sound of ace. Yeah, now I'm going to look up Calaroe Rule 34 and see if Red has that too. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yeah, that's a lot. Do they of... really have everything? Yes. All right. Well, yeah. That so, was so, sort of... so remember that, you know, we have this text because, you know, people in super Christian Orthodox byzantium thought that this was you know worthy literature to to caught to survive and copy down so who knows how much actual like really graphic pornographic literature was written that was just 
never copied down yeah. because you know <laughs> you know imagine you know some 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 bit some orthodox monk in a monastery on mount athos you know, <laughs> you know trying to copy that like uh, i guess we should keep some of these but like uh, th- i don't know man these this, are real this, corny this one, this, one, this, this one's pretty pg yeah you know yeah that it'll work. This will work. It's got some I, I, chapters I think, missing. I think I'll copy this and then copy like you know, uh, you know the the Cappadocian file fathers ten <laughs> times, you know, to to make up for it or something. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> All right, I've got two more names for the haha funny gag names <laughs> reel okay. that I've accomplished here. Um, the first one being, of course, something we mentioned before, Polycharmus. Polycharm, it's Polycharmus because that totally sounds like the name of some poly dude that lives in Seattle who is just really aggressive <laughs> on any of your lady <laughs> friends that show up to the party. And he's, you know, he's got a soul patch and a little caterpillar mustache. <laughs> and you will never convince me that that's not exactly what he, that's how I saw him in my head the whole time Polycharmus. whenever he was coming to Carius's you know. rescue there. In addition, I mean, the... <laughs> that that character existed for the sole purpose of keeping Carius from killing himself yes. like ten times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Remember that line in the summary where I was like, "Meanwhile, Carius keeps trying to kill himself." That was just it was just interspersed in the book. It was like, "Oh, tried to hang himself. Whoop, tried to I don't know suicide by a centurion or whatever. I forget what he was doing. Um, all kinds of weird stuff." And then Polycharmus would just roll up in his fedora and be like, nah, bro, no. think of all the ladies and your wife that you must get back with. But, you know, he finally, the, the c- c- combo breaker at the end is, you know, you know, when the king goes off to to fight the Egyptian revolt and uh, everyone goes with him. And then, uh, you know, uh, Kairos is like in front of the palace being like, oh, she left, everyone left. I'm just going to kill myself right here. And then uh, Polycharmus is just like, you know what? All the times before I would have stopped you, but like <laughs> I'm cool with this now because I want to I want to kill myself too after all this. <laughs> but why don't we do it in the best possible way? Let's go out in a blaze of glory yep. and fight in this war. Uh and uh and they do so and they're like they have this just death wish and what that does is it turns them into like these like superstar warriors and Kairos suddenly like becomes like the admiral of the Egyptian Navy and like wins and everybody loves him. It's just a complete, that, that was something that I like from a, like a literary criticism perspective. I just like, didn't like about this is because he was this really pathetic, like character all throughout who was like kind of dumb, Yeah, you know, in many ways, obviously he was, he, you know, gave way to his emotions and didn't really use his rational fal- faculties too much until suddenly, like, he had this death wish and suddenly he just transformed into this, like, this Homeric warrior uh, who was, like, everybody admired uh, and he, you know, he kicked ass. Yeah, uh, I, and- I was also thinking... I had the stomach. I had the... <laughs> I had a similar thought, Jeremy, too. I was like, yeah, what? It was like all of a sudden the author was like, shit, I gotta like make him cool and stuff. Oh, I just like scribble this story, this version in. It was, and it almost felt like the author was trying to make him as cool as Calero because everyone thought Calero was basically Aphrodite in the flesh. And even though Carius was always. A, you know an attractive noble as you said you know he wasn't the smartest he didn't have anything to his name so it, it sort of felt like the author was trying to even out their um kind of statuses in society for tor- for the end of the book so they could kind of both be yeah. celebrated yeah something like that but yeah you know if you yeah and but Calaroe is like probably the most intelligent uh figure in in the whole book and you know and you know the the, the modern editor of your translation just calls it the Calaroe, mm. uh which is not the traditional like title of this it's Kyrius and Calaroe, you know oh. in most other editions and i think that reflects the fact that Caraton, you know made Calaroe really the the main protagonist here the person with the most depth and right. the most interesting character and she's the most intelligent because she's put into all these impossible situations you know we really kind of get uh, we look into her mind, there's all these situations in which she basically has to uh, kind of deceive people or twist the truth uh, in order to survive or, you know, to avoid some kind of potential unpleasantness. And she has a real kind of handle on, you know, uh, what she has to tell people. Um, and she doesn't actually like 
yes, she's very emotional all the time, mm-hmm. but, you know, she's also very much kind of in control of herself, um, unlike, you know, Carius or a lot of these other people. Um, yeah, she's a really, so. I, yeah, absolutely. She's and a very clever is, heroine. Yeah, and this is, you know, this is, and this is one reason I like kind of to tell people about these stories is, you know, the Greek novels, are, romance novels are really an part a part of ancient literature where we have these complex intelligent you know strong female characters uh even though they're accompanied by you know a lot of kind of tropes of oh she's extremely hot right. and you know uh the whole plot is you know around her you know uh sexuality and everything mm-hmm. um but you know there's precedent for that too because you know if you read the odyssey penelope is a, is a very similar True. kind of uh archetype of a lot of these heroines you know she herself has to use deception and uh in her wits uh in order to you know make the best of her situation you know all the way through uh while she's beset you know by all of these uh challenges uh and threats to her to her chastity and whatnot Right. And that's a very common uh, kind of feature of these Greek novels where, you know, the heroines are uh, trying to get ways to kind of preserve their their virtue for, you know, their lover, um, which is one thing that's interesting about this particular novel is there's actually a situation in which she has to compromise her, you know, marital chastity mm-hmm. uh, in order to survive. She actually has to, you know, sleep with Dionysius uh, in order to convince him that, you know, the child that she was pregnant with was his, right. uh, uh, because she, you know, who knows what he would have done otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I was also <laughs> struck by that. I mean, and I remember, you know, back in, from my time in classics, I remember these kinds of things were really also important in Rome. Um, but yeah, chastity and motherhood and marriage were all really important. Uh, and it was, yeah, it was just really clear how it showed up in the text. Um, although, I was surprised by like how, I don't know how heterosexual this was. Uh, it did. It just felt, yeah, it felt really modern in that sense. You know, it's like a hot girl, hot guy. They love each other. They're, you know, I don't know. I, I guess I was expecting uh, some other characters to maybe not be heterosexual, but that didn't happen ever. So I don't know. Mm-hmm. Oh, that was interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Um. So in like the classical period of Greece, uh, you know, we have literature in like Plato, Aristophanes, whatnot, and we have a lot more, you know, evidence of, and of course the Iliad itself with Achilles and Patroclus, oh, we have, um, you know, we have a lot more kind of discussion of uh, homosexual uh, romance and, lo- and love, uh, especially in the poems of Sappho between women, right. of course. Uh, and that was more of a thing in the archaic and classical period of, of Greece, you know, the, say, the 700s through uh, 300s BCE. Uh, but once you get past that period, and you get into sort of getting into the Roman period and the Hellenistic period, um, you know, then heterosexual romance becomes more and more uh kind of discussed. Uh, and so you end up with the love poetry of, you know, Catullus, Ovid, mm. and and Propertius and whatnot during the late Republic. Of, and then once you get into the empire, then these sort of stories uh, of, you know, are uh, more common. Mm. Uh, because, you know, the classical literature, you know, doesn't, you know, it doesn't treat like marital love as, you know, this sort of you know, special thing. It was more of just a thing you did. A lot of marriages were arranged. And so sort of kind of romance as we would think of it was more, you know, outside of of marriage, you know, Mm. and say, you know, between two men like Achilles and Patroclus. Um, But, uh, you know, moving forward through the ancient period, um, we see, um, particularly as women, generally gain uh, more social freedom in the Hellenistic and Roman periods. Um, We see, you know, uh, these kind of stories uh, getting more airtime. And this is also evidence that the that women were part of the target audience Mm, of these novels, because you tend to think of, you know, ancient classical literature, whatnot is like, oh, this is for elite men to read only. But, uh, you know, not all of it was. And there were certainly highly educated uh, women, you know, at every period who read, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey and all the, all the way mm. through, including this stuff. Okay? Um, but now we have literature that, uh, you know, has not just, you know, as I mentioned, 
uh, you know, strong, intelligent, you know, compelling uh, heroines as protagonists. Um, but ones that are positive models, yeah. okay, Penelope types, rather than, you know, Medea or Cleopatra or Clytemnestra, Phaedra types who were, you know, strong women, but because they were strong women, they were, you know, uh, troubled, they were, they <laughs> you were know, troubled, right, right? right? They were, they were threats to, you know, the, the patriarchal order. Um, and so here we have instances of strong women um, who, um, for better or worse, um, conform to, you know, a lot of these, um, you know, these, these sort of normative practices. So speaking, speaking of like normative practices for women, something that struck me as odd when I was reading this is the breast bearing guilt trip that <laughs> a mother uh, literally just rips her shirt open. And was it when her son was going to go to war it was and Carius die? was leaving. Ah, uh, yeah. It was when Carius was leaving to like go on his Calaroe hunting trip. And his mom's like, we're going to be dead by the time you get back. So say goodbye to these. <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, that's, what it, a weird thing for a mother to do. It'd be like, it's our last chance like, to see you know, Because kids. I fed you from these, this is the last time yeah. you'll see them. So, like, like really harping on the Carius, you're not going to be here to take care of me in my old age. How <laughs> dare you? <laughs> Yeah, was... Mom. Geez, you're embarrassing. <laughs> Put your press away. <laughs> All right. So what's going on there is, and I believe that line is they actually is a direct quotation of Homer's Iliad. Ah, uh, okay. From so this is so this is from Book Twenty Two of the Iliad when Hector uh, is uh, you know outside the walls of Troy, uh, kind of getting ready to face Achilles in kind of the the ultimate showdown, uh, you know, at the climax of the epic. And all the other Trojans are inside because, you know, Achilles was on a rampage. They ran inside. And so Hector's, you know, mother Hecuba and her, his father Priam are, are on the walls. They're looking down at Hector and they're like, what the hell are you doing? Get inside. Achilles is going to fucking murder you. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, if you die, you know, who is going to protect us? You know, uh, you know, think about... You know who's going to protect your your poor mother, the poor mother who, uh, you know, who nursed you as a kid, you know, as a baby rather. Or won't someone please think of the breasts, please? <laughs> yeah, and, and then she she literally whips out her breast, and uh, you know, as an appeal to his sense of fami- of mm. filial piety, and so that's a move that and. Uh, I'm glad, and kind of the function of that quotation is, you know, that's a moment in the Iliad where Hector is basically has to decide between his duty to his family and friends and his city, but it also his duty to himself as a warrior, uh, you know, following the heroic code and, uh, you know, standing his ground, fighting Achilles uh, and going out in a blaze of glory. So this is a, a direct callback to that in this story. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so Carius is doing the same thing right. where he says, no, I'm not going to stay in Syracuse, you know, for the sake of my parents here. However, conflicted I am about it. You know, I want to go out on this adventure uh, and, you know, find my my uh, my and fi- well, at this point, you know, find uh, the people who, you know, stole the, uh, you know, the His body wife. of my wife mm-hmm. and uh, the, uh, you know, and the treasure from the tomb, you know, and kind of investigate what's going on. So that sort of call to adventure stuff. Um, so yeah. All right, so well. I think that's a, that's a, and, and also we see in the, in like Aeschylus's, uh, libation bearers when Orestes is about to kill his mother, uh, Clytemnestra, you know, in revenge for Clytemnestra killing his father, Agamemnon, she whips out her breast, uh, as well so in order to a, appeal. it's just a thing Greek ladies it's, do. It's, it's, it's just a thing time. Greek ladies it's, do, just... uh, yeah, Amazing. to, uh, you know, to, you know, try to persuade their you know, their children to, you know, think of me. Yeah. Yeah. All right. (laughs) Imagine if you were like acting up in the grocery store as a kid (laughs) and your mom just whipped them out to get you to stop. (laughs) All right, mom. God, you're been fine. Put Jeez, the okay. Away. All fine, right, I'm fine. sorry. I'll put down the. I don't need the fruit snacks. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't need the animals. Fine. <laughs> um. Yeah. No. Great. That. I mean, that makes that makes total sense with that context. Um. There was another. I mean, there was another line. Uh, barbarians are by nature women mad. And was this a common? 
idea at the time that any anyone not of Be- Greek Before stock- you even get into that, I want to just say how hypocritical this line is when everyone in this story <laughs> is like, Ugh. is Calaroe mad? Calaroe. Yeah. I Everybody, I not just barbarians. Okay, now the context, please, <laughs> Dr. Swift. That is, that is a great irony that I would, and I would not put, that I would not put it past an author like this. Uh, but yeah, the... Uh, you know the the trope is that uh, anyone who isn't Greek mm. uh, yes. is a barbarian. So barbaros, you know, was the word that just meant somebody went bar 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 bar, you know, because their lang- they couldn't understand their language, oh. they didn't speak Greek, uh, and so they were a foreigner, and therefore they did not, you know, they were not educated in Greek culture or literature or anything, and therefore they were less civilized. So it's so yeah, there's a lot of chauvinism. Mm. Uh, that is going on uh, in this novel, um, you know, in several aspects. And certainly the idea that barbarians are, you know, uh, I think it was like gunaikomanes or something like that, you know, women crazy. It is the idea that barbarians, you know, uh, by nature have less self-control um, than Greeks. Than Greece, which of course is complete bullshit oh, if you yeah, read the whole thing, as, as Chris pointed <laughs> out, you know, because these novels essentially were kind of like appealing to people's sense of, you know, uh, that the emotions were a powerful force within, within us uh, and in a society where, you know, there were a lot of situations in which it was seen, you know, as proper to kind of suppress those emotions, like, you know, especially with like the philosophy of stoicism mm. and stuff. But anyway... All right. Well, that yeah, that that answers that question. Uh, yeah, I was just curious if that's kind of a sentiment that we got from the Greeks, because I mean, that sentiment kind of prevails today, right, in the Western world, where um, often, you know, people who are white and speak English look down on people who are not those things. Right. And it just I don't know. I mean, it seems yes. the barbarians, the foreigners, the non-Greeks. Yeah, they uh, they don't they can't control their emotions uh, and they can't rule themselves. And this is the big thing. Uh, <laughs> they can't rule themselves. Therefore, uh, they uh, need to be ruled by others. Yeah. Lucky, okay? lucky and them. Which is, why, which, is why, <laughs> which is why they live under the Persian king. OK, right. because they're no they're no greater than slaves okay? yes. because slaves uh, who lack self-control need to have an external force controlling them as opposed to we free Greeks who can control ourselves yes. and we live under, you know, laws and in, in a society with free speech and all that BS because this was all a fantasy, of course, because these were Greeks writing under the Roman Empire when, yeah. you know, uh, instead of the Persian king in charge, it was the it was the Roman emperor. And so there's certainly some parallels we can think of there, yeah. uh, you know, when they're writing there. Um, speaking, so. speaking of <laughs> slaves, I there was there's an idea in the text that I thought was just absolutely bonkers. And there's this, this idea that slaves can't be beautiful. And <clears throat> I thought that was odd because. I mean, from what I understand, almost anyone could end up a slave at that time. You know, it wasn't slavery wasn't restricted by race or or anything like that. So it was just interesting to me that they thought that slaves couldn't be beautiful. And this this comes up because, you know, Calero is, of course, um, sold as a slave and everyone can't believe like, how could she be a slave? She's so beautiful. And I was like, but it doesn't make any sense. (laughs) Like, I don't don't understand. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that 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 kind of uh, assumption was certainly a thing, um, you know, even among in the, among the Greeks, you know, they had uh, this idea that, you know, of being of noble limit lineage, you know, being of, you know, being a eupatris, right, mm-hmm. being of a, a good father, good ancestors. Um, and there's this kind of. So, yeah, they they definitely had that idea um, that and, and there was definitely a racial component to it, too. Mm-hmm. So, you know. For the most part, at least Greeks in the classical period, they tended not to enslave other Greeks. Um, oh. And they just they thought the barbarians were the ones that were you know worthy of being slaves, um, except for the Spartans who enslaved fellow Greeks. Uh, and because uh, and, you know, because they were awful. <laughs> but uh, in general, like. Yeah, yeah, maybe uh, that's what uh, I was thinking look, of. Cause the, whole, I... the whole the whole thing with the whole thing with helots and everything. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Um, definitely uh that kind of thing Hmm. um yeah um or yeah and i guess before we before i'm done uh i i just wanted to address like all the tropes i was able to identify that have carried through um from this novel to today Uh, the first one 
the first romance novel trope is the main character and or their love interest is hot as fuck. And like, you know, the woman has extremely pale skin and a mellifluous voice. And the, the man is handsome and tall, specifically tall is called out. And I was like, God damn it. Is this where we have this stupid trope from the fucking Greeks? Is this why everyone wants a tall guy? <laughs> it's so weird. Um, trope number two was like people from rival families falling in love. Uh, three was love at first sight. Four was jealousy spurs a fake cheating breakup scheme because that's a very common thing we see in media today. Uh, one spouse is dead, but not really, and the other spouse feels responsible. Uh, and then lastly is uh, the happily ever after trope, which which we also get. So those are the six that I saw. I don't know if there were any other ones that, that you two noticed. But... Uh, that's pretty much the gamut of them, and I had the point here that if this is really sort of the er romance novel one of the first ones there i i don't know i don't think you were doing this paris either where you were kind of giving it crap for having these because it is perhaps the origin <laughs> but do you have to give it a little more credit then because it wasn't as prevalent perhaps maybe this was one of the first times that the protagonist lady was super hot and the the love interest was also super hot and that's why it survived for so long because that was a unique idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to point out those tropes because they are so. Yeah, they definitely sustained. Yeah, it, today. yeah. They're important for us to point out because of how long they've endured. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, if this is the first time or or one of the first times where all of these elements have been together in a work of some kind of media, then yeah, of course, it, it's not. It doesn't have quite. I I won't. I wouldn't have quite the same disdain for it as I do now, where thousands of years later people are still fucking doing the same thing. <laughs> That's really the problem. Yeah, That's right. Really, the problem. The problem is is my current uh my current position in time. <laughs> I have, that's my <laughs> if only. Problem. Yes, that's if <laughs> only we could. I do. I do have one quibble with one of the tropes. The one where you said jealousy spurs a fake cheating breakup scheme. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, a storytelling trope in a way, but also. Not entirely just a thing that people do as well sometimes, right? Like, Yeah. I mean, people are also hot and fall in love. I mean, that doesn't make sure. it not a trope. <laughs> I, no, no, but that one specifically for me, I guess I was interpreting it as like, you know, jealousy and then you don't listen to what the other person has to say. Yeah. Instead, you just run up and kick her in the stomach right. before she has a chance to say anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, you know, the old kick in the stomach trope. We still... It still uh, survives today. Yeah, yeah it does. And uh, that's kind of terrible. But yeah, like, I, that's just one that I kind of had a minor quibble with. But I just kind of wanted to bring that up that this is perhaps one of the first times that this has been collected altogether. Like, so. yeah, it's kind of honestly a little mind breaking for me to think like this, all this stuff together used to be an original idea. I mean, I know, Jeremy, you said that some of this stuff was kind of present in comedy is before this, maybe. Yeah, a lot of these tropes, you know, they existed in prior literature. But as you said, you know, this is sort of a, a new medium to kind of synthesize uh, a lot of these stories. So, you know, kind of this the romantic adventure stuff, you know, if we go back to, you know, just, you know, Homer is a very, as I mentioned before, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey are, you know, common, uh, kind of common touchstones for these authors. And, you know, to the point where I think the reader is expected to be familiar with, with Homer. So, you know, so think of like, you know, Helen of Sparta, then who becomes Helen of Troy as the original, like, you know, person, you know, woman who is, you know, so beautiful that it causes, you know, an international incident. <laughs> yeah. uh, so there's certainly, there's certainly precedent for that. Um, ideas of, uh, you know, the star-crossed lovers and, uh, you know, we have the, the myth of Pyramus and Thisbe, um, you know, is, you know, the basis for kind of the Romeo and Juliet story. And so mm -hmm. that's certainly, uh, you know, there's there's a bit of version of that here uh, and just kind of mistake, you know, irony, mistaken re uh, or, or uh, recognition scenes yep. and uh, and a mistaken recognition. You know, that is definitely out of ancient comedy as well. Um, so so, yeah, this isn't, you know, a lot of this isn't invented out of whole cloth, but it is certainly uh you know, at least this is the earliest, you know, example of kind of how it's all brought together. And, you know, another common trope that I would like to 
you know, kind of inject into this mm-hmm. is, you know, the being captured by pirates thing oh, is one of the most yeah, common tro- that's It's the one of the most common tropes in ancient novels. And, you know, it and, you know, it, it is in the prior literature, you know, uh, think of the Odyssey and it is yeah. as well. Where Odysseus is basically, you know, a giant pirate who goes around and wrecks people's lives. Right. And his own. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Exactly. Uh, and. You know, I bring that up because that actually, you know, we think of like, oh, you know, pirates and everything are, you know, the, you know, Johnny Depp and all that, you know, Defoe stuff. And uh, well, in the ancient Mediterranean, you know, well, even today in some parts of the world, you know, being captured by pirates and it was a real danger. <laughs> Okay. Uh, you didn't just like go out into a boat to, and then sail to from like Athens to Antioch, you know, on a whim. Yeah. Uh, you know, you needed to know what you were doing because there were definitely pirates going around. Like the Roman, when the Romans came along, you know, the, the threat of piracy was less so because they wanted to control the shipping lanes and everything. Right. But, uh, you know, it was still and also like just going from city to city, you know. Uh, on the road, you know, there were land pirates or just brigands yeah. or whatever. You know, the the Greeks and Romans would just call them all by the same name because it didn't matter if you were in a boat or not. But anyway, but it was, but it was a real, but it was a real, uh, a real danger uh, of the of the of the world that Caraton wrote in. And just one more thing, this included uh, capturing uh, people who seemed to be aristocrats, okay, so that they could be ransom right this is this is what happened to julius caesar it happened to the god dionysus uh in one of the myths uh and that didn't end up well for the pirates uh (laughs) except for the one guy who recognized him uh and you know julius caesar was captured by pirates but then he you know escaped he was ransomed but then he came back and uh and killed them all uh so you know this is and as i said with nero you know killing papyrus Papyra, right? Papaya with the <laughs> kick to the stomach. You know, there's uh, there's more reality going on here than you might expect. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's fair. If you think of the if you think of the context, so um, so Papyra is the ancient Greek Elvira, is like what I'm thinking. In my <laughs> <mind>. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Papyra. Um, and yeah, I, all I was gonna say a minute ago was like, imagine if driving around was like that now. Like, all right, we're going to go to the show. We're going to roll out in a fucking Mad Max caravan because we have to drive all the way to Brooklyn. <laughs> and we might be accosted by brigands and be fucking captured and held for ransom. Yeah. Wild. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, um, that's I think that's kind of all I had to say about the text itself. Before before I move into the uh, can we fix it section, does, does anyone have any <laughs> any final comments on a couple of non sequiturs to throw in at the end here just complete apropos of nothing here there was a line um in this book that speaking of being temporally displaced (laughs) Paris, i think this is really a great example of perhaps you are um similar to it was in the same scene actually with the uh it was evening and much of the booty still remained oh yes (laughs) <laughs> this line was, the party was a glittering success, and I imagine both flute players and singers had already been heard. So Paris, you would have been a fucking smash hit <laughs> at some ancient Greek parties. <laughs> I mean, Just fun- bringing both the entertainment, the, the highest forms of entertainment possible. Oh, fun, if, fun fact. If- uh, when I was, when I was taking Latin uh, and doing classic studies, I used to play flute at, uh, at many of our celebrations, like for Saturnalia and, and other ones. And my, um, one of my teachers played cello and yeah, so uh, you're right. <laughs> you're, you're right. I do have a purpose in the ancient world. Hooray. I'm not sure sh- if you, if I don't, I might add, uh, you know, uh, the, the social status of musicians uh, in uh, Greek and Roman antiquity was, was uh, not so glamorous. <laughs> not great. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, so like, you know, there's the whole trope that at an ancient Greek symposium, you know, that uh, flute girls, you know, uh, uh, were, you know, not were not much uh, different than than hired prostitutes. Uh, okay, Pap- uh, papyra and, flute and, and girl. Often, <laughs> and, and often, 
And often, Fuck. and often they would, you know, uh, you know, they would play one flute to start, and then, uh, and then another <laughs> one. <after that. laughs> you know what? You know what? Though, real talk, no shame on sex work, y'all. It, it's again so the cool. base paintings. Yeah, absolutely, it's in the base paintings. I didn't make this up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, those yo, those those papyra vase scenes. Have you seen those? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Well. <sighs> So yeah, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps perhaps you might have, like I I don't know the way they put it there seems like you would have been having fun at parties I suppose yeah <laughs> I guess best way I, to put it I suppose so having a time ah uh, TBC okay, <laughs> um. oh it's funny there's a there's a uh, I think there's a couple of times in like ancient Roman literature where uh, you know I think it's like the Emperor Domitian's wife has uh, an affair with an actor or musician (laughs) named Paris, (laughs) actually. (laughs) You know, this isn't this isn't how I wanted to come clean about my time traveling, you two. This is, you know, really fucking just pulled the goddamn rug out from under me. Now I gotta admit to this. Yeah, all right, all right. I ran forward through time to escape persecution from my, my horrible mistakes in ancient Greece. (sighs) <sighs> what about loot boys? Would, would I have been yeah, you cool been, at all at parties? Yeah, you would have been a loot boy. <laughs> yeah, I would have been. All right. Well, in any case, the final non sequitur <laughs> thing was related to one of the names that I had was trying to bring up earlier, but I figured I was just kind of punctuate this whole thing with. <laughs> um, we mentioned the region of Caria before in the summary and in my head, I just decided that that was the place where Disney's car cars took place. Ah, uh, yes, that's where the Cars franchise took place in Caria. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's a uh, that's another region of uh, of Asia Minor, you know, Southwest uh, Turkey, um, uh, near uh, actually near Miletus, where you know Dionysius or Dennis, you know, was hanging out, uh, and, uh, and it's where Lightning McQueen <laughs> oh, yeah. is from too. Right, right. Uh, it's also near uh, <laughs> Aphrodisius, uh, which is where Keraton is from. And so I think one reason that Miletus and that part of, you know, the world is, you know, a major setting for this novel is because that was that was Keraton's backyard. Hey, so. <laughs> OK, two things there. Like, so what's the carrion scale? Is it just like car noises? Like, <laughs> like yeah, what? just honks. Honks. <laughs> Uh, honk, honk, beep. And then secondly, commonly car horns are fifth. Actually, they're harmonized. Really? Fifths, oh, that's so. interesting. Um, and secondly, are we are we say like are we saying that technically the first Western romance novel comes from Aphrodisius, the place that the place where we get the word aphrodisiac? Like, is this whole this whole romance thing is really coming together? I don't. I don't know if the word derives from that place or, or what. But I, I mean, Aphrodisius. You know, the city w- was named after yeah, Aphrodite. You know, and uh, mm. it's. I think it's just a coincidence that Keraton is. You know, uh, has his name because his name means you know uh, is related to the word Charis, which means like the Graces, who were you know the 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 goddesses mm. of you know beauty uh, and and grace and charm and and whatnot uh, related to, to you know related to Aphrodite and all of that. So, yeah. <laughs> I just think it's funny that the guy that wrote the romance novel is from a city named after Aphrodite. Hmm, fun. Yeah, it's, I think it's just a coincidence, but it's... Uh, it's a fun one. It's a fun one. And the Greeks like liked coincidence like that. They like did. That, and then, so they played <laughs> up on it. All right, Paris. Can we fix it? Uh, I mean, I guess for me, it's like... I don't in an ancient context, I'm not sure there's much I would fix since this whole thing, I guess, was kind of groundbreaking at the time, you know, this new format, putting all these tropes and ideas together in a modern sense. Sure. Yeah, there are things I could I would fix, like I would want more kind of inner monologue and dialogue and for for that to be a bit more realistic. I'd also prefer the writing to be less telling and more showing. But again, these thoughts reflect thousands of years of (laughs) time between me and when this was written so i kind of thought you were a time traveler uh i kind of feel like i don't know if my critiques are like if if the way i feel about it really matters in a way i don't know just because i'm so estranged from this piece in time um but but then again jeremy you did say that this was kind of 
simplistically written and that there is other fiction sort of 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 this period that is more complex and perhaps would fit what I would be looking for. Yeah. So, yeah, as definitely you're right. Um, so of the, you know, the handful of, of ancient Greek novels we have, this is certainly one of the more, you know, unsophisticated. Again, the, you know, the plot is, you know, just one, one, one thing leads to the next, um, you know, the psychology isn't that complex. It's basically just, you know, you know, a lot of, of, of that, yeah. um, you know, goes into, there's not a lot of philosophy, yeah. for instance, uh, or, or other, there are some, like, there's evidence that, like, you know, this guy, like, knew his, like, legal context, because, you know, they have the trial scenes, oh, yeah. and, you know, uses a lot of legal terminology, so, the, so it's kind of interesting, mm -hmm. you know, for that, uh, but, yeah, if you, if you are, if you want to have an example of a Greek novel that is, you know, much more complex, uh, and in perhaps more immersive, you know, I would check out uh, Heliodorus's uh, Ethiopian story, uh, which was written in uh, kind of the late Roman period, in one of the last of these, uh, you know, um, but again, uh, don't feel bad if, uh, you know, you didn't really think this was that great a book because even in the scheme of Greek novels, it's not the best. And, uh, uh, and that was the judgment of, you know, most of history on this, <laughs> yes. uh, because again, it barely survived, you know, uh, the Byzantine transmission. Uh, and even when the other novels were, you know, read pretty widely in early modern Europe, you know, there wasn't really any attention paid to this one. Uh, but uh, again, it's, I think of it as the original trashy romance yeah. novel. And so I thought it was appropriate for, uh, for this, for this podcast. Oh, so yeah. uh, thanks for, thanks for indulging in my, uh, my little uh, idea here to, to, to see what you think. Oh, it. no, it's great. I mean, this is so different from stuff we normally do. I mean, Having, I, although I think this might be the second edition of Terrible Scroll Club. I feel like we've made, <laughs> we've, we've had a Terrible Scroll Club in the past and I can't remember which book it was for. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really interesting to read something that was translated from an ancient language, um, you know, to have you on the show who had actually read it in that ancient language. And yeah, just to kind of experience a very early version of some of the stuff that, that we read on the show super fascinating and having your input on the historical context was super helpful. Um, it's really fun to have real experts on the show with us. Chris. <laughs> yeah. And, and I should add, I am not like, I don't specialize in the ancient novel as like my research mm. specialty. Like, you know, I've, I've read them. Uh, I kind of sat in on a seminar on, on them. And so like, you know, I know a few things, uh, but, uh, you know, anything I say today was kind of more from a general kind of familiarity with the cultural context, just to sort of make sense uh, of, of what's going on in the story. Yeah, um, yeah. And it, I mean, it was great. It was super helpful. I mean, obviously, like leagues, leagues more than what we could have done on our own. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but yeah, I was, uh, truth be told, I've been you know, trying to think of a way to have Jeremy on for a while now, um, just because we, you know, for full disclosure, we all know each other through through the evil heavy metal scene. Blah. Uh, so it's it was fun to finally have the opportunity to do this. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I guess if, if no one else has anything, I'll just launch into thanking everyone. Yeah. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, patrons, for making this this ancient, terrible scroll club possible. Thank you to Dari, Greg, Veronica, Will, D, Jared, Lynn. Sinya, Yakub, Bobby Black Cat, Jensina, Licorice, the patron formerly known as Mayo Cat, Elliot, Kieran, Martin, Jay, Scott, Luchek, CTAP1, Miri, Yanka, Robert Allen Cook III, David, Julius, Anya, and our newest patron, Anonymous Human. Thanks so much for Ooh, becoming. <laughs> Thanks so much for becoming a loathsome librarian, uh, Anonymous. If you also want to help support the show, you can subscribe to the channel on YouTube. That costs no money. Uh, if you do want to give us money, Sub's though, been popping off lately too. So get them while they're hot. <laughs> get those, yeah, those subscriptions that you could never have again, Chris. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's the way. Just join the, you know, everyone's into it. Get, you know, join the party. That's true. That's true. You want to be popular? Subscribe yeah. to us on YouTube. Uh, but if you do want to give us uh, your actual dollars, you can donate one, five, or ten dollars a month to the show via Patreon. Uh, and over there we have some 
exclusive videos of us, so you get to see our faces and not just hear our voices. And we also have sort of Mystery Science Theater 3000 style commentary on some bad TV and movies. Uh, sometimes there's outtakes. Sometimes there's also some other, I don't know, audiovisual stuff on there. Uh, otherwise, there'll be an can... accompanying patron thing for this one. That oh, is you're right. I forgot vegetable based. Yes, I Let's forgot say. to say uh, this is also at Jeremy's recommendation. We uh, we watched uh, the vegetable version of Oedipus. Uh, so <laughs> that's all that's available on the Patreon now. It should have come out this morning, the same day uh, that this episode was released. So you can enjoy that with us. Uh, otherwise, you can follow Terrible Book Club on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Goodreads if you're on those platforms. Uh, most importantly, though, we'd really love it if you just shared the show on social media or like told someone about it that you know. Uh, also, keep those reviews coming, and we will read them on future episodes. You can contact us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Goodreads, Patreon, or you can send an email to terriblebookclub at gmail.com. Uh, and you can find Dr. Swist at most metal shows happening in the Boston area on Twitter as at Metal Classicist or over at his blog, heavymetalclassicist.home.blog. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks again so much, Jeremy, for being on the show. I know you have a pretty busy, you, you've actually had a pretty busy podcasting <laughs> appearance schedule uh, and, you know, you just moved and stuff. So I just extra appreciate you being here today. Thank you very much for accommodating us. Hey, no problem. Uh, thanks again for having me on. And, uh, you know, since you were just fa uh, thanking your uh, your patrons there, I'd just like to you know kind of dedicate uh, this episode uh, to uh, one of my professors at uh, the University of Iowa, Craig Gibson, Ooh, Craig. Uh, who introduced. Yeah, he uh, introduced me to the ancient Greek novel uh, at a uh, in a graduate seminar that uh, I he let me sit in on even though I was ABD at that point and not every professor lets ABD students do that. So oh. that was very generous of him. And so we read uh, Achilles Tatius, uh, uh, Lucipi and Clytophon, uh, another uh, wonderful Greek novel uh, in Greek. Uh, and so uh, I thank him for kind of getting me interested in this stuff and uh, allowing me to <laughs> kind of get it out there for you, for your uh gentle listeners yeah thank thank thanks craig is this is this what you thought your teaching would become <laughs> i hope i hope this is what you wanted <laughs> but uh no knowing craig i i believe oh it is. fabulous oh man i can't wait to meet craig one day um anyway Stop yeah thank saying that name the discord robot will get mad or something oh shit yeah actually i'm pretty scared of the disc for any of you who don't know this, the Discord robot that records you is named Craig, and we're using it today for the first time. And yeah, I'm a little scared. Maybe I shouldn't keep saying Craig or it'll like summon him or something. Now, now I'm freaked out. Oh. oh no. Oh no, you've enraged him, Paris. He's coming <laughs> oh, for us. Oh no. He's going to kick us all in the stomach. No, Run. Oh, good thing I've been doing crutches. Oh.